Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for another uh, um, another episode of our Safer at Home series talks. Glad to have you with us tonight. Um, um, hope, hope you're uh, enjoying the fall weather. A um, couple things before we get started. As you know, all our talks are brought to us by uh, Cape Cod Five, uh, First Citizen Federal Credit Union, and uh, Martha's Vineyard Savings. Um, Every book that's uh, um, on our series is available at Eight Cousins Bookseller. So um, um, hope that you uh, visit with the locals. And um, uh, as many of you know, that this is this is my last one. Uh, so uh, from henceforth, it's going to be uh, uh, Roseanne Demelio is going to be your host starting next week. So uh, it's been it's been a pleasure and an honor doing these things with you. So I um, um, uh, I. Uh, I'm going to miss you guys. Um, our guest tonight, uh, David Crew, is a local historian. Um, he's written a couple of different books, and one of, of local history, including something about Scully Square. He's written about um, the Curse of the Bambino. And um, uh, his name was actually given to us by uh, one of our viewers uh, and, and supporters, Scott Wayne. He said, you really should talk to David Krug. He's got a really cool talk about the Ponzi scheme. So as someone who's been dying to try to figure out how a Ponzi scheme works, I am the great unwashed. Um, uh, when David came out, I said, please explain it to me because I have never quite figured out how this works. So would you welcome our guest tonight, David Krug? Thank you very much, Mark. Good evening, everybody. And uh, I first have to say I was watching the the uh, pre-show slides, and I'm I'm very flattered to be part of such an auspicious group of authors that you're having in this series. So thank you very much. Thank you, Scott, uh, one of my former co-workers at Analog Devices, from which I have retired. I also see Meredith and I see Murray and now I sound like the romper room woman as I look and I see all these names of people I know. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming to tonight's talk, which is about a financial scam that is so outrageous, so audacious and was so bloody successful that today we still invoke the name of the perpetrator when describing similar scams. And his name, of course, is Charles Ponzi. Charles Ponzi grew up here in the small town of Parma, Italy in 1893. David, your, your, was, your, 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 your video went away. You have to put your video oh, back on. Oh, I'm very sorry. And, and share your screen. Yes. Well, I turned my video off deliberately. There, there we okay. go. So my video is off because I want you to focus on the slides. Um, so as I was saying, Mr. Ponzi grew up here in Parma, Italy. He was of middle class parents and they could afford him to send him to university. But there he was something of a dilettante. And so they decided what good old Charles needed was some toughening up. So they put him on a steamer bound for America where he was to work with an uncle as a uh, in some blue collar job, loading and unloading and really just toughening the kid up. Well, <laughs> he lost the two hundred dollars his parents had given him in a shipboard poker game. And when he arrived in America, he decided that toughening up was really the last thing he wanted to engage in. And so he began to drift around. He got various jobs in New York and Pittsburgh and Providence and New Haven. And we can sort of follow his path. And somehow, we don't know how, he ended up here in Montreal as a bank teller, working for the Banco Zarossi, which was a bank that really catered to the local Italian community. Now, it turns out that Mr. Zarossi had made some bad investments, and Ponzi was having a drink with his friend, a fellow named Scarpini, and Scarpini saw some opportunity here. And working with Ponzi, they got Mr. Zarossi to get involved in uh, a few uh, schemes, if you will. I almost hate to use that word because of what's going to happen. These were minor little 
plans to try to improve the number of depositors in the bank. One of them may have kind of skirted the edge of the law. So to protect Scarpini and Ponzi, they had Zerosi forge a check, kind of as insurance, basically to say, you don't think on us and we won't cash this check. Well, Scarpini somehow gets Charles Ponzi to cash the check. And then he turns around and he, and he turns Ponzi in. And the next thing Charles Ponzi knows, he is the guest of the government of Canada here at the St. Vincent du Paul Penitentiary, where he spends about a year. When he is released, he gets a job as a translator for a man who wanted to bring five Italian laborers across the border into Vermont. Well, it turns out it was really a, um, um, a migrant, uh, uh, a scheme to bring migrants illegally into this country. And so Charles Ponzi ended up spending a year at the guest of the United States government here at the US penitentiary in Atlanta. When he is released, and he's released with his mugshot, uh, he begins to take on various jobs and kind of working his way up the East Coast. He works for a power and light company in Alabama. He's a bookkeeper because now he has, he has bank teller on his resume, so why not? And he winds up here in Boston in 1918. And I absolutely love studying Boston at this time, right after World War I. It's an absolutely fascinating period of time, both in Boston and American history. First of all, um, you have the Volstead Act, which is going to make it illegal to sell or serve alcohol in this country starting in 1920. You have World War I. Uh, tens of thousands of Americans had died. And with the coming of the Spanish flu, we all know what a pandemic is now, 20 million people worldwide would eventually succumb to this horrible disease. It's a fascinating time of social change as along with the Volstead Act in 1920, would come the amendment which would finally give women the vote. It was also a time, uh, thanks to growing animosity and pressures between the races, as well as it is claimed uh, some movies that glamorize the Ku Klux Klan. We saw a rise in lynchings and in uh, uh, racial tensions here in America. And in sport, we, of course, had the Black Sox scandal. Say it ain't so, Joe, when uh, seven members of the, of the Chicago White Sox were found to have thrown the 1919 World Series. Here in Boston, we saw some truly bizarre tragedies like the January 1920 explosion of a one million gallon tank of molasses. By the way, what do you use molasses for? You make rum with it. Enough said there. On the Boston Common, uh, agitators and communists and socialists and anarchists would stand up literally on soapboxes, uh, extolling the public to try to go to their way of thinking. In 1919, members of the Boston police strike went on strike and eventually parts of the city, here's a picture of Scully Square, showing the Massachusetts militia, which had to take over uh, maintaining law here in Boston until a new police force could finally be organized. Speaking of tension, not between the races, but between the um, between different uh, cultures, as tensions between the immigrants, like the Irish and the Italians and the Jews and other Eastern Europeans, and the Yankees, in no smart exacerbate, small part exacerbated by himself, 
James Michael Curley here surrounded some of the Yankees. As you can see, they don't look very happy. All of this, folks, is going to help set up some of what's going to happen in our story. Okay, so Charles Ponzi, twice convicted, twice serving sentences for two different countries. He makes his way here to Boston and gets himself a, a, a room and a Somerville triple decker. He gets a job with the J.R. Poole Company, an importer and exporter. It lasts there only a few months. They fire him. Never explains why. Mr. Ponzi himself wrote an autobiography, which is, uh, which is just a lot of fun to read. And he never quite explains what happened. We just know that he lost his job. The way he describes it, though, his next the next thing that happens to him in his life is really quite charming because he describes he's been thrown out of work. He's riding a Boston trolley when he spies this woman. Her name is Rose Necco. And in his autobiography, he describes her as, quote, the greatest gift America bestowed on me. Well, it also turned out that Rose had a relative who had a grocery uh, fruit company, uh, the Necco Fruit Company. And so she convinced her uncle to give her beau a job. Well, we don't know exactly what happened at the Necco Fruit Company. We just know they went out of business six months after Ponzi got hired. But Ponzi he didn't want to be in the fruit business. He didn't want to be a bookkeeper or a teller. Ponzi was looking for that million dollar idea. And you know what? I think he might have found it, although he might have been about eight decades too early. You see, in 1919, he comes up with an idea for something called the Trader's Journal. This would be a loose leaf bound magazine which would be tailored to different parts of the world. And depending upon what country you were in, he would take pages that he had written specific to, let's say, the, the tariffs or the taxes or the exchange rate in Spain or France or Italy or wherever. And depending upon where you were, he would custom make that magazine. It's very much, folks, like what the web is today, where they detect your IP address and they know where you are and they custom create a web page for your location. Well, he looks around for investors for some strange reason. The Necos will not invest. And uh, things get so tough that he has to take out a promissory note to a furniture dealer just so he can hang on to the measly desk, chair, and file cabinet that he has in his office here at 27 School Street. Okay, now it's December of 1919. And he has a few subscribers. And one day, he gets a letter from a correspondent in Spain. And out floats this little piece of paper. It is an international reply coupon. Now, according to an international agreement of about 30 countries around the planet in 1919, you could use this coupon as kind of like a self-addressed stamped envelope is. So what you would do is, let's say you're in Spain, as Ponzi's correspondent was, and he didn't want to burden Ponzi with having to go and pay for the postage to return his letter. So the guy in Spain would go to his post office and he would buy this IRC, stick it in the envelope, mail it to Ponzi. Ponzi would go to his local post office, take that IRC, and he would get a first class stamp good for mailing that letter back to any country on the planet. Ponzi describes this moment. It's one of the few, I, in my opinion, genuine moments in his autobiography. For he suddenly has 
this epiphany. I mean, the clouds parted, the angels sang, and Charles Ponzi in that moment had figured out how one can make money from the international reply coupon. And now I'm going to show you how he was going to do it. So we start out, as I say, with the international reply coupon, good in about 30 countries around the planet for one international stamp. Let's take Italy as an example. So in America, the exchange at the time, the exchange rate of one cent would get you about 10 lira in Italy. Here in America, an international reply coupon, that's a first class international stamp, is five cents. Okay, here's what you do. In Italy, the coupon costs you two lira, which means, folks, that for every coupon in America, you could get five coupons in Italy. You're following me? I think you are. So let's do an experiment. We'll do exactly what Ponzi did. He contacted his uncle back in Parma. He sent him $1. The uncle took that dollar and he converted it to 66 international reply coupons. He converted the dollar into lira, the lira into coupons, and then he mailed this package of coupons back to America, where Charles Ponzi converted them in that three, into $3.30. That's what it was worth. Well, you have some expenses. First of all, stamps are not legal tender here in America. So he had to sell the stamps to people and he had to give them a bit of a break. He had to spend a few cents on the dollar with his uncle in Italy. Got to give him a little piece of the action. So that original dollar came back to him actually at about $2.10. That was his profit, which meant that Charles Ponzi could make 210% on every dollar that he invested in this matter. He was immediately just, he, he was just thunderstruck and he didn't hesitate. He went out and he created these certificates for a brand new company. You gotta love the name. It's the most delicious name, iron, irony in, in, the, in the history of finance. He named his company, the Securities Exchange Company. Yes, folks the SEC. Okay. He goes out and he tries to convince people that they're going to make a lot of money. In fact, he's offering a 45% profit in just 90 days. Now, this is a time when banks are giving three, maybe 4%. So there's a factory foreman in South Boston. He takes a flyer, 50 bucks. He buys $50 worth of these certificates, which is an amazing leap of faith. But the word starts to spread. And by the middle to the end of January, he's only been in this business, this SEC business, about a month. He's already taken in $870. And now word begins to spread and he realizes he's going to need some help. So he hires agents. If they sell a certificate, they get 10% commission, which is pretty good commission. Himself, he exchanges with butchers and bakers and even with the jeweler so he can get a, a nice piece of jewelry for his beloved Rose. Things are going so well in February. He's got over $5,000 now coming into the SEC that he has to hire a secretary, one Lucy Melly, a recent graduate of a secretarial school here in Boston. Well, he learns a valuable lesson in marketing, which is 
word of mouth is the best sort of advertising. So to increase traffic, he pays off his first investors early. Well, now word really starts to spread. But interestingly enough, only amongst the immigrant community. But that's okay, folks. He was doing really well. In fact, he had to start hiring clerks to keep up with the huge crowd that was starting to line up at his door every day. Now, it was a cash business, um, which meant um, that they were having to take the money that was being taken in and, and figure out where to put it. Um, he could afford file cabinets. He could afford desks and each of those drawers were quickly being filled up by cold, hard, green cash. Things are going so well. He decided that the early payout was working so well, he would up the return. And now he tells people, you can get 50% on your money. Think about that. Get half your money again in 45 days, and he will double your money a 100% return in just 90 days. That's a 400% per, um, interest in one year. Well, as you can see, the curve is starting to get a little steep. And by March, he has taken in almost $30,000 with these new offers. Crowds begin forming at lunchtime outside the building. And finally, finally, somebody asks, what are all these people doing lining up on School Street? In fact, how come most of them are immigrants? So finally, the police are called upon to investigate. So um, a detective and several officers make their way down to 27 School Street. They go up to the fifth floor. They go into Ponzi's office. He breaks out a chalkboard and he draws for them the plans for the SEC and how the money gets transferred and how he makes his money and how he can afford all of these high profits. And you know what happens when that meeting is over? Several of the officers bought certificates in the SEC and they told some of their fellow officers about this guy, this crazy guy who's doubling their money in three months. And now Charles Ponzi had a de facto security force guiding people along down there on School Street. But so far, there is no interest outside the immigrant working class of Boston. In fact, um, something I've always found especially funny, and I've said so to some, some of my reporter friends, that Literally around the corner from here is Washington Street, where eight of the nine major dailies in Boston were located. And the reporters who worked in those buildings would fight their, have to fight their way up School Street to get to lunch in Scully Square, which is on the other side of School Street. None of them ever stopped to ask the question about what are all these people doing lined up outside this office? Okay. Gosh, I love history. And I love how it's like dominoes. You know, we've all done that thing where you align the dominoes up and you push one domino and you, and they all start to fall one after the other. Well, the story of the Ponzi scheme is of dominoes falling and somehow getting pushed back up and then falling again. It's kind of like two dominoes down and one domino back up. Here's the first domino in our story. In March of 1920, these three countries pull out of the IRC agreement. Now, in France, stamps were legal tender. Romania had a great exchange rate. So did Italy. But Italy, more importantly, is where Parma, and many of Ponzi's family were located, and allegedly where he was having people do all that exchanging for him. Well, when word of these three countries pulling out of the agreement reached the Postmaster General, 
he decided to send the inspector to pay a visit because now it's a postal issue, not a financial issue. This is about the integrity of the post office. Well, the inspector and some of his minions, they arrive at 27 School Street. They make their way up to the fifth floor. Ponzi breaks out the chalkboard. And when he's done, you know what happened? Yes, you do. The inspector and his minions all bought certificates in Ponzi's SEC. So things are going really well. That domino maybe looked like it was going to fall, but hey, more and more and more people are just making their way and they're giving Ponzi his dollars, their dollars, and they're just waiting for their big payday. And then in April of 1920, an old friend shows up in Boston. Remember back in Montreal, that guy Scarpini, who talked Ponzi into talking Zorossi to get involved in some shady dealings and hand them the forged check, and then Scarpini turns his friend Ponzi in? <laughs> yep, uh, that's who showed up. Scarpini somehow got wind of what's going on. He saw the crowds. He heard the name Ponzi. He licked his lips. And the next thing you know, Ponzi has a manager for his brand new New Hampshire territory. Scarpini got some cash, a brand new car, and hopefully Ponzi was rid of his old friend. But this kind of put the fear into Ponzi that maybe stuffing his money into trash cans and desk drawers and file cabinets, eh, maybe it wasn't the smartest thing to do, especially with people like Scarpini lurking about. So Charles Ponzi did what so many Americans and so many Bostonians like to do, which is to put his money in a nice, safe bank. And then he starts paying off the mature certificates from his SEC with good old fashioned bank checks. But Ponzi was not starving, folks. He was doing very well. He bought himself this beautiful home in Lexington. The home actually, uh, within the past year, went on the market. It's a beautiful home. Ponzi himself had six servants, not counting the chauffeur that he hired for his brand new locomobile. And then in April of 1920, he achieved one great immigrant dream. You see, he hadn't seen his mother in almost 17 years. And now he could afford to bring it to America. Now, we historians, we use a lot of tools to, to learn what went on in the past. You can use court documents, you can use newspapers, you can use diaries. And sometimes a picture really does tell a thousand words. I want you to look at this picture and you can see Charles Ponzi, his arm around his wife, Rose, and the love, the, how it's clear these two young people we're madly in love. But I want you to look at the daggers that Mama Ponzi has given Rose. She's taken my boy. Love this picture. All right. Ponzi starts to go on a, on a buying spree. He decides to take the money that he is making from the SEC and start investing. He buys a construction company. Um, he buys a macaroni manufacturer and jokes, well, at least I'll never starve. Then he does something, I don't know, sounds a little strange to me. He buys stock in banks. Yeah, the guy who makes 400% in interest is buying stock in places that only give 4% interest. Well, he also buys a $3 million insurance policy. Ponzi really was a showman. And it was widely talked about that he had this insurance policy that in case of his death, all of his investors would be paid off. 
And of course, that just endeared him even more to the people who are investing in the SEC. Well, look, um, I, I know that attending tonight is a friend of mine, uh, Murray, a financial advisor, and he's extremely bright. And Murray, I, I know you're ahead of the curve. I know you knew already what's going on. You don't need an MBA to figure this out. The awful truth, Ponzi's not dealing in IRCs at all. It was a pyramid scheme. For every dollar that he was taking in, he needed $2 to pay out those early investors. He was literally robbing Peter to pay Paul. And eventually, well, frankly, you, you run out of Peter's. Look, if you've robbed $450,000, which he's done up to this point, it meant that you're going to have to pay out $900,000. He's almost half a million dollars in the hole already. What he needs is an infusion of cash. He wants to pay off the investors, and then he wants to get out of the SEC, get out of the IRC business. He's got a plan. Ponzi always had a plan. The Hanover Trust, where Ponzi had put uh, the bulk of his money, had a president, a Polish emigre named Shemolinsky. He was something of a braggart, and he liked to talk about his ties to the Polish government. And Ponzi looked at the exchange rate. He looked at the cost of IRCs in Poland. And what he came up with was a plan for the Poles, the Polish government, to sell him $10 million in certificates. He would take delivery over six months and exchange them here in America for stamps and then have the cash to get out of business. It sounds a little crazy, but even the U.S. postmaster weighed in and said not only is the plan legal, but he would redeem, the government would redeem one million dollars worth of certificates right off the bat. Now, Shemolensky, for some reason, gets cold feet. Maybe his common sense took over. We don't know. We do know that Ponzi was furious because here it is. It's June and all this great publicity. The money's rolling in. His debt is doubling. It's two and a half million dollars in the hole. So partly out of revenge and maybe mostly out of desperation, Ponzi meets with the Hanover board. He wants to buy controlling shares in the bank. Now, they refuse. The last thing they want is this, is this guy in charge of their bank. But he owns a large chunk of the, of the, of the board. So they agree to sell him just enough short of the majority to placate him, but not let him run the, run the show. What they didn't know was that Ponzi had lined up the votes of six stockholders. And before they knew it, Charles Ponzi was the director of one of the biggest banks in Boston. They even gave him an office in the building. After all, he is a director. And now, because he's a director, with his signature, he has access to millions of dollars. Now, here's the paradox about Charles Ponzi. I'd like to point out right now that he could have cut and run. He could have, but he didn't. He thought with the bank directorship, things were going so well that he could extricate himself from underneath this pyramid. And now get ready for another domino to fall. Because remember that furniture dealer? Um, he had given Charles Ponzi a $50 promissory note. Now, Ponzi paid off the debt. He paid off the IOU and he paid off the interest. But on July 3rd of 1920, that furniture dealer, a guy named Daniels, files a $1 million lawsuit claiming the IOU made him an investor in the SEC and entitled him to a share in the profits. Now, that freezes all of Ponzi's assets. So 
ahead of the regulators, ahead of the court officers, Ponzi scrambling to each bank, trying to retrieve as much money as he can before the regulators can freeze them. Then he hires a defense attorney. <clears throat> and now, suddenly, the newspapers are interested. A $1 million lawsuit, that gets your attention. This is Edwin Grosier. He is the editor of the Boston Post. Another one of those newspapers right around the corner on Washington Street there on Newspaper Row. He dispatches a reporter to interview Charles Ponzi. And a story about the lawsuit appears in the Sunday, July 4th paper. In that article, Ponzi claims he has $2 million in assets. Now, what do you think happened when the SEC opened for business on Monday morning? Yeah, pretty big crowd outside 27 School Street. Yeah, yeah, some were there to withdraw. But you know what? Most wanted to buy. The logic was, if you, when you talk to the people in the crowd, look, only a rich man could be sued for $1 million. Well, it's great publicity. It's a very positive thing. It brings in more and more investors. But now, with $3 million in, there's $6 million that he owes, and the money just keeps pouring in. By July, it's up to $12 million that he is going to have to pay out. Now, Ponzi still has that bank directorship. His assets may have been frozen, but with a brand new account, any new coming in, any new money that he takes in in that new account, he can use. So what he needs is more money coming into the bank. He needs more money in the Hanover vaults that he can use as an emergency fund. So he engineers a, a contest for new bank investors. And so uh, this is back before it was proper for a bank to advertise, but the board grudgingly let him run this contest. To promote the contest, he hires this guy. He's a new practitioner of a brand new uh, branch of marketing known as public relations. This is Bill McMasters. And Bill McMasters was pretty good at this brand new art form of public relations. He got the Post, the very same paper of Edwin Grosier, to publish this puff piece on Charles Ponzi. Pretty good publicity. But McMasters then convinces Ponzi to meet with these guys, the Attorney General and the Bank Commissioner. Yankees both. I mean, look at those happy faces. What does Charles Ponzi have to worry about? So Ponzi makes his way up to the state house. He meets with the attorney general. He meets with the bank commissioner. He meets with their retinue of lawyers. And what do you think happened after the meeting? Yep, at least one of the AG's lawyers would buy certificates in the SEC. Charles, uh, John, uh, Mr. McMasters, he arranges another positive story to appear in the press. In this one, Charles Ponzi is called the Pied Piper of School Street, with quotes from New York financiers proclaiming Ponzi a genius. The crowds are spilling out the door when Ponzi gets driven to his office in his locomobile from Lexington. He's cheered. And the story is, somebody yells out, three cheers for the greatest Italian who ever lived. What about Marconi, Ponzi, Ponzi replies. He invented radio. Yeah, but you invented money. <laughs> so things are going well. But it's, it, it, it seems to me that Edwin Grosier was in battle with his own paper because the post subsequently published an article with a devastating question from a fellow named Clarence Barrett. You bright MBAs, you bright finance people, you ask the same question, I'm sure. Why does Charles Ponzi, 
who's given you 400% a year in interest, why is he putting his money into banks that only give you four, four and a half percent? Well, Ponzi's reply is to sue Clarence Barron for $5 million. Now, he says the money will go to charity. And that's all well and good. But now the DA, another Yankee, by the way, has to get involved. He's had enough. The Clarence Barron story, the run on Ponzi's SEC. He joins with the AG and the bank commissioner. And what they do is they request Ponzi to please stop selling certificates while his books are examined. He still has to pay out mature certificates or refund the money for anybody who wants out. Now, this is good. This keeps one of those dominoes from falling because as long as Ponzi can pay out, that's fewer certificates he'll owe double on later. But word starts to spread of the investigation, and there's a $3 million run on the SEC. Now, many are cashing in certificates before maturity. Remember, he's writing checks, which are <clears throat> based on the deposits at the Hanover Bank. But every certificate turned in uh, before maturity saves him a dollar. And somehow he survives the run. He's still solvent. So as long as he pays off everybody, there's no case against him. So things start looking up. But then the Hanover board, nervous that he might cut and run, they force him to buy a million dollar certificate of deposit. Now that's money that Ponzi really can't afford to spend. He, he needs it to be able to pay people off, but he's got no choice. They've, they've, they forced his hand. And then this article in the post a few days later, which details the difficulties that authorities are having with the books. But there's one more article in here which really affects Ponzi because I think they buried the lead. See, they had this quote from the New York Postmaster who said there weren't enough coupons in the entire world to account for Ponzi's profits. And he looked at the books. In New York and New England alone, there were only 360 dollars worth of coupons sold in the last three months. So where's the money coming from? This devastating question now got the, gets the attention of this guy. He was days away from the vice presidential nomination of the Republican Party. Thanks to his stand against those strikers, those police uh, men who struck back in 1919, Yes, this is Calvin Coolidge, who ordered one of Boston's most renowned accountants, a fellow named Edwin Pride, to go over Ponzi's books. And now comes the next, you can't make this up event in this story. Because the next day, an article appears in the Boston Post. It's August 3rd, 1920 which states that Charles Ponzi is four and a half million dollars in debt. The person who wrote that article should know it was Ponzi's PR guy, William McMasters. Yeah, he was a former newspaperman who really wanted to get back in the business. So he turned around and he ratted Ponzi out. Well, now it is front page news again that Ponzi is barely, not even solvent. He's so much in debt. It causes another run on his business. Now, we don't know exactly how he pulled it off, but somehow he survives another run on his business. But he still needs more money to keep paying out. Again, got to pay out so he don't get arrested. Now things start happening really fast. To get access to that million dollar certificate of deposit because he needs the cash. 
Ponzi bribes several members of the Hanover board so he can borrow against the CD. Now, folks, that was illegal then. It's illegal now. But now he's got the cash to keep going until the audit is done. He also figures out a plan to cover the four and a half million dollars shortfall. What he was going to do was sign, let's call it a bridge loan. He was going to use money in the Hanover Bank to make it look as if the SEC were solvent. And of course, it wasn't. And he might have gotten away with it. But on August 9th, the very next day, Edwin Grosier gets a call. We don't know from whom. It might have been Scarpini. Who knows? Maybe Scarpini wasn't doing well enough in New Hampshire. But Scarpini tells Grosier about the shenanigans back in Montreal. So Grosier calls the Montreal police. Now, there's no fax. There's no teletype. There's no wire. He has to they have to send a mugshot by mail down to Boston of the guy that they had arrested there, Charles Ponzi. Edwin Grosier, being a good reporter, he calls Ponzi for comment. And for the first time ever, Charles Ponzi actually has nothing to say. So now all Ponzi can do is hope that the audit is completed before the mugshot gets printed because poof, that's it for his credibility, even with his fellow immigrants. Now a bit of good news. That same day, Edwin Pride having so much trouble. This is the best accountant in Boston, okay? He has so much trouble with his books. He asks Ponzi to shut down. Just, yeah, just son, just, just shut it all down and let's figure this thing out. Well, this is great news. The leak is stopped by the government. Ponzi doesn't have to pay out. And he can look at all of his fans, all of those people down on School Street and say, look, I, I, I wanted to give you money. But the Yankees won't let me. On August 10th, the bank commissioner gets wind of the bribe of the Hanover board. And he orders the bank to shut down because now they have to be investigated. Well, this is the worst possible news, of course. There's no money to cover the four and a half million dollar shortfall. But it doesn't matter because the next day, the mugshot runs in the post. They had arrived in, 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 uh, from Montreal. Grosier looked at the mugshot. He looked at the picture of Ponzi in 1920. It was obvious it was the same guy. The next day, August 12th, 1920, Edwin Poole calls Ponzi to his office to go over the audit. You owe four and a half million dollars in the red, Mr. Ponzi. Have you the funds to cover the shortfall? No, he replies. And then he turns to the U.S. Marshal who's standing behind him and says, I guess this means that I am your prisoner. Well, this is the biggest story since the molasses flood back in January. Ponzi was first tried by the feds. He was convicted and spent some time, again, courtesy of the United States government. <clears throat> Upon his release before the state trial, Believe me, Massachusetts is going to get its turn. He jumps bail. He runs to Florida. And again, oh, God, uh, you can't make this up. He gets involved in the Florida land boom. He's selling swamp land, underwater land to unsuspecting tourists. He senses they're catching up to him. He tries to fake his suicide by leaving his clothes on a Jacksonville beach then he hops a steamer to New Orleans. You know, there's something about the criminal mind. They can be so smart. They can be so clever. But they've got an ego. And apparently what he did was he bragged to one of his shipmates about who he was. The shipmate told the captain. The captain wired the New Orleans authorities. The sheriff was waiting for him. Charles uh, Ponzi was returned to Massachusetts. He was convicted and he served time here at the Charlestown State Prison where Sacco and Vanzetti and later Malcolm X would uh, serve time. When he was released in 1934, he was deported and he moved to Brazil. 
and he got a job. Um, he got a job working for this guy. Now, the retirement benefits were not very good working for Il Duce. Uh, Ponzi ran his airline office down in Rio de Janeiro, but things went south pretty quickly. Charles Ponzi had a hot dog cart. He even ran a brothel for a while. And he ended up uh, here in a charity ward where he passed at the age of 71. And thus was the end of Charles Ponzi. But I'd like to pick up the story of a few of the people who uh, shared the life with him. His beloved Rose, she smartly divorced him soon after his deportation. And she had a very interesting life. Um, she worked for the mob as a collector. Um, you know, she would go into the various nightclubs and restaurants and she'd collect the protection money. Uh, one of the places where she picked up the money was the Coconut Grove. And she supposedly was there at the nightclub just hours before the fire that killed 492 people in 1942. She later worked in New York for a nightclub owner, a guy named Lou Walters. You may know his daughter, Barbara. Yep, the same one. Rose eventually remarried and lived happily into her 90s. Edwin Grozier's Boston Post won a Pulitzer Prize, one of the very first, for its coverage of the Ponzi scheme. And of the investors, the lucky ones got back maybe a few cents on the dollar. Most walked away having lost everything, including a bit of their dignity. And for the rest of us, well, you know, I think we got smarter. You know, there's no way any of us would ever again fall for such an obviously crooked Ponzi scheme. Am I right? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm going to turn it over to our host and we'll see, I guess, if we have any questions. Thank you, David. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, somehow I knew all roads led, led to Madoff. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess um, somebody had asked this question of me today prior to this thing that it's, it's clearly not the only pyramid scheme that's ever been run we know this mm -hmm. and yet we always know that they're ultimately going to fail out of the fragility and yet how do they succeed so well knowing that and how could people be as successful as they are with this knowing that they're ultimately going to fail because pt barnum was right yeah okay that's all yeah. That's all. I mean, if, if we've, uh, I'm, you know, I don't want to get political, but if we've learned anything over the past five years, you know, people will buy anything. So. Um, a question from earlier, you had mentioned about the Necco Fruit Company. Was that any relation to Necco wafers, ne ne Necco candy? No, Necco uh, spelled G-N-E-C-C-O. Okay. Necco. And your friend Scott asked a question, did Ponzi ever buy more coupons than his original $1 investment? No, he was too smart. <laughs> <laughs> was the Hanover Trust at 10 Post Office Square in Boston? Uh, I think that was the one I'd have to I'd have to double check. But I'm, yes, because most of the you know, that was the financial center of Boston, that area. Um, oh, yes. And 27 schools. So someone worked at uh, 27 School Street. Yes, that was right next to the old city hall. And uh, uh, no. And that's the other uh, amusing thing. He uh, the question is, did Ponzi ever interact with the city officials? And no, they were just more people who kind of had to fight their way through the crowds and never really bothered to ask why. So Ponzi's whole um whole run of um uh, reign of terror if you will was yeah. was basically seven months 
From this, December 1919 until August of 1920. So nine months. Oh, nine months. Yes. Um, I, I find it terribly ironic that he wound up working uh, <laughs> working for El Duce. Um, was James no. Michael Curley ever involved? No. 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 I don't think uh, Curley, remember, had four non-contiguous terms as mayor. Mm-hmm. And I don't think during the, in 1920, matter of fact, it was Andrew J. Peters was the mayor. Mm-hmm. Peters had his own um, scandal. Look up Star Faithful and Andrew Peters. It, uh, it's a harbinger of the Me Too movement to come. Okay. Makes, makes Bill Cosby look like uh, Piker. <laughs> Seriously. How many, how many, you said that he, uh, most of his clients were immigrants. How many clients, customers, people, do we think was involved? How, how, how many people invested in him? Do we have any clue? I, I don't know the exact number. No, it was it was in the thousands. Remember, you know, he collected six and a half, almost seven million dollars at, at its peak. That That's a lot of, you know, a lot of people buying 50, 100. You know, it was all that get rich quick screen scheme. And by the way, that was a question. Someone says oh, it's, it's our friend who worked at 27 School Street says the SEC has uncovered three schemes already this year. Why do folks go for deals that are too good to be true? Again, you know, I, I, P.T. Barnum was right, you know, and uh, uh, people, a lot of people just don't believe that slow and steady wins the race. They want it all now. I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't play one on TV. It just, <laughs> it's just, you know, I, I fall back on it's just human nature. Um. It, obviously he was being lionized during you know the, the spring and summer as he's making all this money for people supposedly mm-hmm. um what what was the fallout i mean what it, it i did it's almost like this immigrant on immigrant crime i mean did they uh how did obviously they must have felt used abused but i mean what what was the fallout internally for the for people that invested with him. Charles Ponzi was able to start a business um, without having to fill out a single form uh, to take out a single license. He never had to take an oath to fidelity. Um, I, I, Murray, I don't know if you're a CPA, if you have any, but, but there are uh, um, there, there are things you have to do here in this state, Massachusetts, in order to be able to advise people on finances. There wasn't any of that back then. You know, it's, it's kind of like um, Dr. Brinkley and the patent medicines. You, you know, you, you, pe- there was no FDA, so people just came out with patent me- medicines. It was after the Ponzi incident, and of course, with uh, the New Deal and during the Depression, all of the control, the SEC, by the way, that's when the SEC was formed. Um, and, you know, once the the wild exuberance for letting businesses just have their way and do anything they wanted, people finally started, oh, you know what, maybe it's time we start setting some rules about how people can do business. So uh, what directly laws came out of Ponzi? I, I don't know explicitly. Uh, it's not like, you know, the coconut grow fire and then suddenly every, you know, nightclub and restaurant had to have the panic doors, that sort of thing. Uh, it was more setting a tone, setting a mood. The 20s were not really the time to do that. Again, we were just so in love with business and the way the economy was roaring. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're talking at a time of F. Scott Fitzgerald and everything too. So yeah, you're right. So um, David, thanks for taking the time to talk about this tonight. I, I, oh, I, I find this me. fascinating and it, it just, and it, it, you're right. This, the, the, how the dominoes keep falling and how history does keep repeating itself. We know there'll be another one. I don't know when, and I don't know who, and I don't know how, but it, we know it's going to happen. Um, 
Um, so I, I, I guess your ultimate point is right that uh, PT Barnum was correct. So, um, um, so thank you for, for taking the time and explaining this. I, I, My pleasure. Thank you everybody for, for showing up again to, to treat, to see some old friends, some old coworkers here in the audience tonight. Thank you. Thank you for coming. All right. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you everybody. Um, good night and stay safe. And, uh, thanks for being a part of this. I, I greatly appreciate it.